Welcome, everyone. Welcome to the 5,378th meeting of the Rotary Club of San Jose. I am, as always, your president, Sal Pizarro, and I'm thrilled to see so many of you here, both uh, in the room and, of course, on Zoom. I'd like to, of course, thank the San Jose State University Committee, chaired by Mike Conniff, who's out cruising around right now, and Deanna Persai. We'll be hearing about some of what's going on at San Jose State in a few minutes. Can I get a Go Spartans, though? Thank you. And as I know, uh, you guys are all enjoying our special lunch today, which is being catered by Poorhouse Bistro. As you know, next Tuesday is Mardi Gras. My theme this year is Let the Good Times Roll. It seemed like the appropriate time to have a little Mardi Gras in New Orleans in our meeting. I'd like to thank Jay Maduri and his team for being out here again. We had them at the first meeting. If you weren't there, I hope you're catching it here. Got plenty of food there. Don't be shy. It's friendly. Go up and get seconds if you want to. At least, but wait until I get mine. And of course, we've got coffee at the end. Oh, Matt's straightening me out. This is, this is about to turn into a Buster Keaton movie. Now you have to stand there and hold this the entire time. So, but to finish my thought, so as you know, last year, Poor House Bistro, which was in an actual house over on Montgomery Street, uh, or Autumn Street, moved down to the Little Italy area. They're still working on hooking up and getting everything uh, ready to welcome diners and guests. Uh, they're hoping to be open this spring. Spring's a long time, but they're hoping to be there. But until then, they're set up uh, serving at Mimosas of Willow Glen on Willow Street at Bird. So they'll be there for Mardi Gras next Tuesday. If you don't have your own plans, head over there and have some fun. Uh, and we'll be looking forward to being back at the real Poor House Bistro in Little Italy later this year. Okay, so let's uh, get our traveling mics. They're over there to introduce themselves. Holly, why don't we start with you? President Sal, I'm Holly Elkins. Happy to be here today. Thank you so much. And where do you work, Holly? I work at Presentation High School. I'm the president there. Thank you for asking. Go Panthers. <laughs> Good afternoon, President Sal. This is Keiston Smith. I'm with Silker Management Company, and my uh, sponsor is John Ball. Wonderful. Okay, if visiting Rotarians or Rotarians with guests could please stand. We'll start with Maggie up here. Yeah. yeah. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Maggie Padovani, and my guest today is Ayesha Moten, who's the president of the Rotaract Club of San Jose State University. Go Spartans! Yeah! President Sal, I have two students from San Jose State University's I House. Okay. Let me introduce you to Vicki Lee from South Korea. Her major is economics. And also Ted Horn from the Czech Republic. Wonderful. His, uh, his major Great. is uh, engineering technology. Well, San Jose State has, knows a lot about engineering. Mr. President, uh, Rod Diridon, I have Alex Shore visiting today. Alex is the executive director of Catalyze Silicon Valley, helping us with TOD and Phil. Alex, great to see you. I owe you a barbecue. Good afternoon, President Sal. I'm very honored to introduce my guest, Brian Johnston. Do you remember the commercial with two or three Ps? Uh, anyway, he's got two Ps. He's got physics and poetry. So he's a physicist and a poet. Arts and science, very nice. President Sal, Sean Cottle, good to see you. I've got Kent Session here from Cyber Gardner, a uh, high tech company. He's gonna be joining us as a new member shortly. Wonderful, great to see you. Hi Rose. Hi Sal, good afternoon. I'd like to introduce my two guests, Gloria Leventhal, a longtime resident of Willow Glen and also on the board of League of Women Voters and the board governors of the Silicon Valley Capital Club. Well, we could see you. And also I'd like to introduce Matt Fine. Matt is the co-owner of Alpaca, which is a mini Amazon. Uh, Matt is in San Jose, so welcome. All right. 
President Sal. Larry Stone. I have two guests today. The Deputy Assessor. <laughs> oh, don't boo her. She's very <laughs> important. <laughs> the Deputy Assessor in my office, Autumn Young. And my Executive Secretary, Lori Lamley. Lori, good to see you. Okay. Any more? All right, we are moving on, of course, to one of my favorite parts of the program, which is a new member introduction. So if I could have James Williams come up here with our newest Rotary Club member. James, bring in another member. Love it. Sure. Well, everyone, I'm extraordinarily proud to be introducing Jay Corbett to you today. Jay is a brilliant but very down-to-earth man with the desire to serve his community. He has earned a doctorate degree in computer science from the University of Massachusetts at Amherst, and he served as a professor for several years at the University of Hawaii. But 18 years ago, he moved to our area and joined Google, and um, he's still with Google today, where he is a technical expert in data storage software. So Jay and his husband live in downtown and are very close friends of my husband and I, so I'm particularly proud to have him joining the club. And he's really interested in service and working in the community, so I hope some of the uh, commu committee chairs will reach out to Jay and uh, tell him more about what your committee does. So I'm very proud to introduce Jay Corbett. Thank you. I attended my first Rotary Club meeting in 1980 in upstate New York. My father was a longtime member of Albany Rotary and has brought me along as a guest. And I've been thinking about him a lot. He passed away last June, a few months shy of his 93rd birthday. And he and I were very different. I'm an introverted software engineer who worries a lot. He was a very optimistic, extroverted life insurance salesman. <laughs> and no matter where we went, he would, we would run into people he knew. Um, and even if he didn't know them, he would talk to them, which as a shy kid would mortify me. But the older I get, the more I admire the way my father lived his life. He, to him, the world was a friendly place and he served his community both through Rotary and through his church. And as my own career in tech winds down and I look to retire in the next few years, I wanna let go of my lifelong obsession with work. Instead, I wanna meet people I know everywhere I go and talk to strangers and serve my community. So thank you, James, for sponsoring me and thank you all for giving me an opportunity to be more like my father. Wonderful to have you as a new member, Jay. And next, we are going to be graduating a trio of members who've gone from their red badge year to get their new blue badges. So could I have uh, Dr. Mon and Ravinder and Chappie Jones, who flew back in from Costa Rica just for this, I think. Welcome back to the United States, Chappie. Congratulations. Thank you. And, and yeah, I'm not sure that that last month for Chappie 
should have counted. So he might have to have another another month here. Um, okay, next I'd like to call up uh, our executive director, Leslie Hamilton, who is going to give you an update on the next big project. Leslie, come on up here. Right, so how many of you know that we're contemplating very seriously contributing $500,000 without going further into your wallet. Hands, anyone aware? <laughs> so this party got started, got rolling under Brian Adams. Is there someone? There he is. Past President Brian convened a visioning session during his year um, in the wake of the, our 100 year anniversary. Um, and what emerged from that session, one of the things was the idea of a next big project um, building on the success of the Rotary Play Garden, our centennial gift to the community. So Vince Sanzeri, who I believe is joining us on Zoom today, led an ad hoc committee of club and foundation board members who came up with a mission statement and some um, guidelines. Members were encouraged to apply to, put it, to be on this next big project committee. And in 2019, 14 people were um, selected with the goal of um, producing a project within three years. So um, here's here's this committee, uh, Matt Bell, Terry Chapman, Mary Curtis, Jim Eller, Patrick Foley, David Ginsburg, me, Jay Ross, Ginger Satello, Vince Sanzeri, and Honorable Jim Towery. And those of you good at math realize they're not 14 names, but um, um, Robin Doran, James Williams, and Jim Gardner reached into the three-year commitment and opted not to continue. Um, the committee solicited ideas from the membership and over 40 were uh, considered and evaluated. Um, as we homed in on the concept of a Rotary Mobile Health Clinic, we looped in our um, project partners who happened to also be members of the club. So Catholic Charities, Greg Kepperly, Order of Malta, Mike Block and Vic Giacalone and Rotacare, our wonderful chair, Rose Simmons and um, committee member, Brad Barron. So um, if you were here a few weeks ago, you heard from those folks. And as you can imagine, having a mobile clinic like this in the community will have a huge impact. And some of the things we're particularly excited about are the prospect of increasing access to healthcare among low income and homeless people, enrolling those currently um, getting only episodic care into the healthcare system, providing a new long-term home for San Jose Rotacare, our free clinic, combine, combining wraparound services such as uh, legal counseling, mental health services, um, groceries with healthcare and creating excellent brand awareness for Rotary in the community. You'll be hearing additional details about the project via email on our website. Um, the next big project committee is the welcoming uh, greeting line next week. So bring your questions and ask them, ask them of them. Um, our bylaws require that we get your permission before spending $100,000 or more on a project. So you'll be asked to vote on this probably April or May. Um, I've got a timeline here. The, we'll take this to the foundation and club boards, which need to give their blessing. Assuming that happens, um, we'll come to you in likely April. Um, and assuming you approve, we'll transfer funds to Catholic Charities, who will then order this vehicle, which we're told is take about six months to build. And so that means it could be on the road at the end of this year, which is pretty exciting. So this is where I give a shout out to everyone who contributes to the annual campaign and or sponsors the gala because of you, the Foundation Board of Trustees has been able to set aside money to fund this um, and we're able to make a gift without any additional fundraising. So it's not too late to earn your yellow sticker and contribute to this year's annual campaign. And Heather's gonna be up here in a bit to talk about how you can support the gala. Um, thank you to all who've supported this. Thank you to the Next Big Project Committee that's been meeting at 7.30 a.m. on Friday mornings every other week for, it seems like forever, but thank you all. So thank you, Leslie. And she mentioned that Brian Adams uh, started that ball rolling. Well, of course, he's also one of our favorite speakers. So I'd like to ask him to come up here and talk about the Oscars, which he's got his uh, program coming up next month. Right. Kept it warm for you, baby. Thank you, thank you. Oh, it's good to be back up here. Uh, uh, before I, I plug uh, the Oscars coming up, uh, I just want to give a shout out to our guest speaker today. Uh, David Louie uh, not only is one of the most outstanding broadcast journalists 
not just in the Bay Area, but anywhere. But he is a great man. So I just want to give you a shout out, Dave. Thank you for being with us today. Um, back in the day when I worked in television, we never got a chance to work together. And then uh, we, we covered, you covered stories that I was involved in over the years. But anyway, good man. Um, so what can only be described as a momentary lapse of good judgment the program committee has invited me back to deliver my annual academy awards program the academy thank you for that arthur your honor <laughs> the sound of one hand clapping a smattering of applause or what i like to call a squatting ovation um the academy awards will be sunday uh, march 12th my program will be wednesday the 8th of march the reason I'm here is to tee up the fact that you today, this afternoon, I believe, Marie, that's correct, will be receiving from the Rotary office a ballot, a Rotary Oscar ballot, which will have 13 categories on there. And uh, this is important. Please participate and vote. And then uh, we will let you know uh, on the 8th what your predictions are, as well as mine. And then after the Academy Awards, the following Wednesday, if we have a winner, I'm going to assume we have a winner, um, then we're, we're going to give it a prize. And I want to thank our very own Dan Orloff, who again is supplying uh, movie passes and food and beverage credit to Pruneyard Cinemas for the award winner. So we're going to have a lot of fun. And remember, you are predicting what the Academy will choose, not necessarily what you would like uh to to win does that make sense am i making sense it makes sense to me okay well if it makes sense to you we have an issue um so anyway please fill out that ballot uh, you'll have till march 1st to return it and uh, we'll have lots of fun and we will again thanks to uh bill schro and the good folks at history san jose we will have an actual academy award present on the 8th of march so be sure to be here for that thank you thank you that's always one of my favorite programs, and not just because Brian usually gives me some sort of prize every year, but we'll see what happens this year. All right, next I'd like to invite Deanna Persai and Chris Burrell, special guest, to give us a little update on the San Jose State University Committee. Good afternoon, fellow Rotarians. I'm here to um, share with you our activities in the San Jose State Rotary Committee. I'm co-chair along with Mike Conniff, and we have lots of beautiful Rotarians um, who are part of the committee, as, as well as our new Red Badger, Chris Burrell, who's the executive director of the Hammer Theater. Um, one of the activities that we're doing is supporting San Jose State Cares and their pantry. They have a pantry for the students. And so we have donated some money to the pantry. And we're also um, thinking about having to drive, particularly for toiletries. So we're supporting them. Uh, we very much support our San Jose State Rotaract Committee with Aisha Moten here, here, who is the president. And they've been working with actually the Order of Malta to compile some hygiene kits. And then we've donated the hygiene kits, the Rotaractors compiled them, and we donated them to the pantry. Um, the, the Rotaractors have been invited to the I House, the San Jose State I House Olympics Day on the 25th. So we're building bridges between our international house, San Jose State students, and the Rotaractors. Um, we are supporting the International Women's Day and helping with volunteers for that. Thank you, Matt, Maggie Padovani. I'm going to hand it over to Chris Burrell to talk about the activities happening at the, at the Hammer Theater. Yes, hello there. Um, so twice a year or every semester, we, uh, as a committee in our charter, we like to promote uh, and suggest one activity that San Jose State centric uh, that is worthwhile for you to consider. And so um, it's a cheap plug because it happens to be at my theater, but it is San Jose State um, uh, run and it's Trilogy, which is an honorarium brand new piece being commissioned about three great California trees, the Redwood, the Sequoia and the uh, Joshua tree. And it features uh, some really great musicians. So please consider uh, taking a look at that. Flyers are on your table. Thank you. And um, on a more serious note, we just want to hold a fellow Spartans University in our thoughts and prayers today at Michigan State University. We are also the Spartans. Please um, 
be holding them in, in your heart today. Thank you. Thank you both. Okay, I see a woman with, with balloon, I don't know, flowers, animals, where are those? I don't know, it looks fun, but Heather Lerner, you come up here and talk to us about our gala. Okay, great. I am here to remind you that our gala is coming up on March 25th. We hope you save the date. For those of you that said, hey, I've already got plans. I'm going someplace else. That's great. You can make a non-attending gift and then you'll get a yellow sticker. So if you can't be in town, if you can't join us for our spy themed Sal Pizarro's year spy, see what we did there. Um, we hope you'll join March 25th. I think I have some slides. Look at that. That looks fun, right? Looks fun. Look at that. Look at that little custom little like rotary thing. I'm pretty proud. I'm proud of that. Okay, I'm glad you like it. All right. Okay, good. So uh, on a serious note, this is our Rotary Secret Service. On our Secret Service, we, the reason we do this gala is to provide support to many of our community benefit partners and to our committees. The gifts that you make and attend with your merriment and fun at the gala and your non-attending gifts um, will go to support this. We are going for a net of $200,000. That's not total 200. That's a net of $200,000. We are getting back to our 2019 total, so help us out with that. We'll have so much fun. We're going to be at the Signia this year. We've actually bursted out of this room here and we're going to go to the Signia and have a wonderful time there. We even have some heists and shenanigans in store for you. This is a uh not easy to read or see. I guess it's pretty easy to read or see. Um, I want to thank our friends at Your Home Sold Guaranteed. This is our brand new presenting sponsor this year, and he is also willing to have a co-sponsor join him, which is very nice. And then we also have a brand new uh, Golden Gun, which is the Brandenburg Family Foundation, brand new for us. So I'm pretty excited. Let's give him a little clap, right? Yeah, all right, yeah. That's pretty good, pretty good. Um, so fantastic. So you're going to come see me and my gala team out the table over there to, to participate. I think that's the last one. Oh, that's it. Wait, we'll go one more thing though. But if you do join us at the table outside and you commit, come make a gift. Tell us what you want to donate to the prize heist. You too will get a custom made spy balloon. <laughs> Thanks for laughing. All right, you're going to take a look at those QR codes on your table. You can scan those. Our tickets went live today. Check those out. If you have trouble getting in because you need to know your rotary ID, just let me know. Come see us at the table outside and we'll get you signed up. Thanks. Fantastic. All right, and uh, I'll point out very few people have a reason not to be there. Holly Alkins is one of them because her gala is the same night, but she's the only one. So everyone else should be at our gala. Okay, uh, I'm going to skip salutations and hold those for next week, but I do want to remind you that we've got the uh, blind wine tasting coming up. Uh, that's March 9th. The tickets are going fast. Uh, they had sold already half the 60 spots as of last week, there are even fewer available now. So please sign up. Uh, minimum donation, $100 per person, but it's gonna be a fabulous time. And I've been told that if you missed out on the opportunity to sign up for the ax throwing by the deadline yesterday, Doug Smith says you can still sign up by the 19th, that is Sunday. Just get in touch with him and you can Venmo him money and we'll figure it all out. So there's still an opportunity to join me and a bunch of axes. So, and that is on February 26th. So now I'd like to invite Larry Stone. Yeah, yeah get that out of the way first. <laughs> yeah, booing him up now. With our, our <laughs> this week's speaker, David Louie. Yeah. It's all yours. Okay. All right. Well, just as a brief introduction, uh, for more than 50 brief years, is huh? brief is good, yeah, it, it will be. David Lurie has been bringing stories to us from ABC7. Davis has forged a series of firsts in the news industry. He was one of the first Asian American TV reporters in the Bay Area and has been on the air the longest. He has covered some of the Bay Area's biggest and most captivating stories, a few of which we will cover today. His awards and accolades that are too numerous to, to go through fully. They include several Emmys, the National Academy of Televisions and Arts and Sciences Governor's Award, and a Lifetime Achievement Award from the Asian American Journalists Association. 
My introduction could go on for the entire time we have, but let's get right to the questions. For over 50 years, you have reported on three of the biggest Bay Area stories that has attracted intense national attention. The Patty Hearst kidnapping, the Loma Prieta earthquake, the Chowchilla mass child kidnapping, the largest kidnapping in the US history, in which 26 children were kidnapped for ransom and buried alive in a trailer container in the Central Valley. Pick one of those stories and describe it to us. Oh boy, that's a tough one. Is my mic, mic open? Uh, okay, I switched it on, but I don't know why you don't have a dead battery. Let's see. Hey, test one, two, three, four, five. There we go. Now we got it. Okay. Malfunction on my part. Far be it from a journalist to who's been on microphones for so many years, not knowing how to turn the switch on. Um, that's going to be a, that's a tough one. Uh, I think Chowchilla has to be probably the most uh, memorable and most significant story. We all went through the earthquake. We all know what you know, happened here in 1989. Um, certainly Patty Hearst, legendary story about what happened with her. But I think that when it comes to Chowchilla, never have we been prepared to see an entire school bus of kids kidnapped on the way home from school in their bus disappearing off the face of the earth and not knowing where they were and what you know what had transpired why were they why did they disappear and that type of thing um, it was not an act of violence against them in, in the traditional sense of you know physical harm but they went through trauma because they were buried in a moving van in a quarry in you know out, out in Livermore and so for days we didn't know what was going on and we I hope somebody's taking care of them, their feet being fed, cared for, whatever. All of us went down to Chowchilla to be with the families and be with the sheriff's office to try to figure out what was going on to get the latest updates. These were the early days before we had microwave technology, before we had any of the modern satellites that we have now. So we were also shooting on film. So it took a while to get story shot get the film into, into a processing machine and put on the air. So there was this big time lag. Well, thank goodness for phones, because I got a tip about the fact that they just found the kids in that quarry. And I was the only reporter who knew that at the time, because I got a tip from somebody on the inside. And because of sources like that, I was able to mobilize our newsroom and get the team out to Livermore so that we were the first on the scene and we were the first to be able to report the story. Uh, that was exciting, but the fact that those kids were not hurt was so significant. The fact that uh, the, the bus driver, Mr. Ray, was able to keep the kids safe, to keep them calm, to keep them focused on their well being and not to panic. And all of those at that age, when you think about these kids being five to seven to eight years old, this was traumatic. And the fact that he was able to keep them on a level head, on a, on a level ground, and survive that ordeal is remarkable. And the reunion with the families and so forth. But the only bad part is that we know that those kids were scarred, just as we see young people today scarred by all the trauma with shootings in the schools and other traumatic experiences. The mental health of these children, this was long before we had really good programs for mental health. And so we tried to follow those children and try to engage you know, what was part of the healing process. That was difficult because in those days they didn't have the support systems, but the families also circled around their kids very tightly. And so because of that, we didn't really get to you know, document their ordeal. Families are much more open today. They're calling for help. They, they know that the community needs to heal as well. And so from that standpoint, that was a remarkable story that set the standard for what, how we cover story, traumatic stories today. It certainly was. Well, in 1979, you were one of the first Asian American reporters. In fact, one of the first reporters allowed into China. So tell us about that experience. Okay, we're talking about 1979.
stubborn, a stubborn person. And it was clear that even though my circumstances were not as I am familiar with the Southern Structure hardship that they were living in, the Southern Alliance, we knew that uh, we didn't want that to happen to us. This is the period of time everybody will be able to tell us and see and do the things But we go. We stand in an observation to upgrade to the phrase of action to all the things that we have to do. And the time is coming for a while to travel to some of the other And it's very important that we be guided by the people who are moving You did the first interview with Norm Mineta after Norm, when Norm was the Secretary of Transportation, when he ordered all commercial aircraft to land immediately. Tell us about that conversation. Well, I know Norm. Thank you. 
we've lost him, but his legacy is just so amazing. I'm glad I had that opportunity. Well, Silicon Valley was in its infancy when you started. The fact, the term Silicon Valley was not even coined when you started. Apple, Google, Facebook, none of them existed. So what was it like covering tech startups with the likes of Steve Jobs and Mark Zuckerberg back in those days? You know, I go back before we either. thing called, you know, Yahoo that you tell me, what was this thing called Select DNA? Explain that. And so we just sat down and did an interview on DNA with a guy. And I think it's just one of the most pure, pure, pure ideas. Pure creativity, pure vision, and emotion. Um, it's just that. And it's doing the different kind of that kind of thing. Right? Because the arbitrary So that's okay, but we were there at the very beginning, and so that's what we saw. We got to see that inspiration. We really got to see people in their raw form. Um, those kinds of friendships continue today. Steve Wozniak, I still have his cell number, we, you know, he still takes my calls. That's really special to be able to have that kind of access and be able to pick, pick the brain of great minds and people who are still uh, creating ideas and have lots of ideas to, to share with us today. Well, a question a little bit more current. Uh, our region has been hit hard over the years by natural disasters, earthquakes, floods, storms. We now call them at atmospheric rivers, I guess. How difficult was it to cover them? And did you encounter any mishaps, unexpected risks covering these events over your 50 years? Oh, that's a loaded question. Yeah. Wonderful, believe me. But in the old days, we didn't know how to cover these atmospheric rivers. We didn't know about you know, how bad some of these things could be. I remember back in 1984, when the world So I had to go out and cover it. What can I do? Of course, you know, this is Canada. We're trying to divert water and put it into highways and into new homes and that kind of thing. And I'm just saying, you know, one of into the floodwater because I couldn't see where I was going. And I certainly could not see how the water was going to come back. So the head face into the water. The photographer loved it. Take the camera off. Take my phone away. Yeah, of course. I can't see. This is gonna this is gonna make you know this is the really interesting story about how you travel on on space overlay. Well it made national television because <laughs> it, it was dramatic. I mean, it was funny, but it was also dramatic how somebody could not walk up, to, you know, could not bring these waters, navigate these waters, into the floodwaters, as he was walking up the street. Well, 
the saving grace was that my face was away from the camera. Because I was going up the hill, my photographer was behind me. So it was my back that was shown. So my dignity technically was, was protected or saved. Except my mother calls me and says, was that you I saw falling in the water? And I've always laughed saying, only a mother would know her son from the rear. <laughs> Well, let's go back to 1986, when you went to the Philippines to cover the People Power Revolution, which ended in the exile of Ferdinand Marcos. There, or really anywhere else during your career, have you ever feared for your health, life, and safety? Yes. Uh, foreign press were not exactly welcomed by the Marcos regime when we were covering the 1986 People Power Revolution. see that in San Jose, but unfortunately we're seeing gun violence and we're seeing threats of violence everywhere. So I guess that's not the, not going to be, I'm not going to be the only one who ever faces that dilemma in the future. You just never know what it's like, you never know what the feelings are like afterwards when you've escaped the potential of a shooting. As the assessor, I know what you're talking about. <laughs> Larry, you're blown. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Broadcast journalists, both radio and television, used to get many of their leads and ideas for, from sto for stories from newspapers. But with the downturn of the printed news sources, how has that affected broadcast journalism today? <laughs> so, this is a good Thank you. 
the Catholic Church. I mean, the purely secular media that they get it back into the Catholic secular Or if it was a Christian, it was a Christian. They have to do it, they have to put it on the And so, who are the basic And who are the people who are expecting to give it back? Or send it back? Or is it you who are preparing to tell it to the people who are not going to give it back? Who is truly So there are so many competing interests today as to how do you set the agenda for what is news. And we're going through tremendous change. We're going through tremendous self-evaluation. And there needs to be a lot more research going into how we address this future. Because the last thing we want to do is see this bifurcation. I don't, I don't want to see half the people watching TV news, half the people doing only on social media. I think we need to work collaboratively Whatever the future media is, I mean, some people say TV is going to die within five or ten years. Maybe, maybe not. But who's controlling social media and who's controlling what you see on social media? So that's a big dilemma that all of us need to work on together. And people need to become better uh, consumers of media. Now, David, a personal question. You know, anybody who has been successful in life, like you have, and career, has benefited from skill, but also a bit of luck. So what role has luck played in your success? Woo, good question. A lot. Uh, I think I'm, I'm very lucky. I mean, no one, to my knowledge, has been, has made 50 years recording for one TV station in the Bay Area market. Yeah. I feel very lucky. I feel lucky in, the, in regards that there, this has been this has been a, a, a collaborative effort. I look around this room and see people I've interviewed once, twice, half a dozen times, multiple times. Uh, you've all had open doors to me. You've been cooperative. You've been open with me. You've shared your knowledge not only with me but to the Bay Area public, sharing in the collaborative effort being transparent, being supportive, and knowing that knowledge is power. And power is important for democracy. Power is important, and knowledge is important to making informed decisions on a personal level, uh, on a part of our expecting what we want of our elected officials, and what shapes public policy. And so I think from that standpoint, I feel very lucky that when I call somebody, they pick up the phone. And they say, you know, can would you be available? And I, I need this. This is my this is the story I'm doing today. Can you be available in the next couple of hours? I need to get this story filed by two o'clock this afternoon, <laughs> four o'clock news. Whether it's Larry, whether it's you know, someone else, people have been so good live in the back of the room. Uh, everybody's been so helpful to us. Luckiest guy in the world. People have not said no to me. And if we are not for your cooperation and your collective commitment to keep public discourse open and transparent, I would not have succeeded at all. Thank you. Well, in a recent interview, one of your colleagues referred to as, quote, the sacred trust that listeners and readers put in the media to tell a story. Can you share an experience that illustrates the importance of trust between the reporter and, in your case, the viewer? I think the, the toughest thing that every reporter is tasked to do some, at some point in his or her career is knocking on the door of somebody who's been a victim of crime and violence. It is the most difficult thing to do that you can ever ask a reporter to do. I 
think about how many times have I had to knock on the door of somebody who has lost a son or a daughter or some other loved one in their family to try to find out more information about, as we try to do a story about who was this person who, who had an untimely death or what was this person like or what are you as a family hoping, what good would come of this? Some, sometimes you just don't want to do it. Sometimes, as you know, sometimes more often than not, the door is going to be slammed in your face. Trust is the most fragile thing in the world. Having been on the air for 50 years, people tend to recognize you as they look at their ring doorbell output and say, oh, look who's at the front door. Should I answer the door or not? If they see my face, Maybe, maybe I have a better 50 50 chance that they might answer the door. But then comes the next question Will they be willing to talk to me? Well, I've always made it a priority never to ask the photographer to be one more when I walk up to the door. I don't want to confront the family at a that time of tragedy. I don't want them to be, to be feel like I'm being intrusive. I want them to see me as an individual, a human being, who cares and who really would like to get their story if they're willing to share it and if the time is right to share it. The most amazing thing is the high percentage of people who say yes. And that is only because of a bond of trust. Either one's body of work, the reputation you've developed through the years, that you're trustworthy, that you're sensitive, that you're caring, that you're not going to be exploitive, or that you also know how to approach the person with respect, care, and sensitivity. One such family in San Francisco many years ago, their daughter was killed by their boyfriend. We became friends, and she started a social a support group for families of murdered children. And I saw in that family a spark, a spark of hope, that early on, and their, and during their time of great You never know when something as difficult as having a conversation like that can turn into something positive. So it's all because of trust. It's all because of your ability to appeal to people's good side, their sense of hope, their desire to change the world. And I'm glad I had an opportunity for that conversation well, before I get to the final question, David, I, I, over the years, I've interviewed close to a dozen Silicon Valley icons. I think this is one of the most in interesting interviews that I've done in that time. So final question, any embarrassing moments? <laughs> <laughs> the water. Um, yeah, okay, this was when we were when we first walked in the room, we had to put microphones on and prepared for uh, this for this portion of the Q and A. And it harkens back to the fact that we talked on our table about
knew what she's going to be wearing. <laughs> and he said, you know, I never thought about that. And I said, well, you know, it's sort of awkward, you know, because I said, should I just hand it to her, you know, because we, we really want that photo op of pinning her. <laughs> and so he says, well, I guess the best advice I can give you is just follow her lead. If she puts her hand out, then drop the pin in her, in her hand. But she may say, you know, and, and because, because if she wears a jacket, you'll have a lapel to put it on. Well, okay, fine, that's great. So I came prepared for you know, those, those possibilities. We get to the moment of truth, and I'm looking at her. She's wearing this beautiful high neck silk dress. And I keep thinking like, first of all, I don't want to put a pin through a silk dress. But also, it's a high neck dress. So there's no access point to put the the back, you know, the back stop, or whatever you call that thing, to a pin. And this is the day before you well, now that now we use magnets, but you know, they used to use pins on a backstop. So I looked at her and said, would you like me to put on the pin or would you like to do it yourself? And Madam Ambassador, she says, oh no, you do it. She starts to pull her neckline down and invites me to put my hand down her dress to put the back clasp. And so I dutifully put my hand down her dress, put the back clasp and said, please don't drop it. Don't, don't drop this back clasp until I, I gotta have it secure so I can put the pin and put the in, the, in place. I got the pin Pamela Harriman down her dress. <laughs> David Louie, thank you very much. Larry, thank we you, thank you it. all. Thank you, David, and thank you, Larry, another fantastic interview. So, David, uh, on your behalf, we're making a donation to History San Jose, which helps preserve our city's heritage. And of course, you have always been part of that as well. Even though you worked up there, we <laughs> love you down here too. In that little city up there. A couple of quick reminders too. before we close up here. If you didn't get your fill of food, uh, there's some takeout containers. So you can certainly uh, grab some on your way out. And uh, don't forget to bust your table to help our staff out. And next week, because you didn't get enough of them this week, our speaker will be, oh, this thing's not doing what it needs to do. Yeah, you know, no, David Louie's not coming back. <laughs> Larry Stone, County Assessor, speaking on COVID-19, Silicon Valley's economy and prospects for recovery, sharing his insights with us. So we look forward to having you back up here next week, Larry. And that's it. Have a great weekend, have a fun Mardi Gras, and we'll see you next week. Keep the good times rolling till then.